Hello again Blenderheads and welcome back to another Everything You Need To Know tutorial. Now although the last video was technically the last in the Retopology series, this is a continuation because, well, there's no point doing all of this lovely Retopology work if you're not then going to go back and use it to capture all of your beautiful sculpted details. So this video is going to be all about getting the details from your sculpted mesh, like this with all of his uh, little wrinkles and skin details, and getting that onto your retopologize mesh, which as you can see does not have that kind of detail. This is a technique commonly known as reprojecting. Now if you've followed on with the previous retopology videos, you might already have a retopologize mesh that you can work with. If not, don't worry, you'll be able to download this Gremlin retopology mesh from the link in the description below. You will also be able to get this decimated mesh with uh, all the high details from the same link. Both of these meshes are provided free of charge, just remember to use the code FREE once you get to the checkout. But if you wanted to help support the growth of this channel, there is an option to leave a small donation, and that would be mighty fine of you. Now, reprojection isn't always a perfect methodology, and I know from setting up this model during some testing that we're going to run into at least some of the common issues. Which is great, because then it means that I can show you how to fix some of those common problems. So, by the end of this lesson, you'll have a reprojected mesh onto our retopologize mesh here. And then I'll show you how to extract the detail as a displacement map to make it easier to rig and animate your characters. So let's dive into how to set up our reprojection technique. So you're going to want to start with your retopologized mesh, not your, uh, not your decimated or sculpted mesh. For now, let's just leave that hidden and just work with this. Ignore this armature modifier just for now. There's a, a little trick that I want to show you later on, but you, you technically don't need this. This is just because I do have a very simple rig set up here, um, and by simple I mean it is very simple. You wouldn't be wanting to use this particular rig to animate, like for example, he doesn't have toes or anything properly rigged. Even some of the paint weights, are, paint, paint weights aren't perfect there, but it, it'll be fine just for a, a quick posing test a little bit later on. So I will hide that rig again, and uh, let's set up our modifiers. To start with, I'm going to go and add a shrink wrap modifier to our retopo mesh here, and I am just going to go and turn on our decimated mesh just so you can kind of see what happens here. We want to shrink wrap our retopologized re mesh to our decimated mesh. We do that just by clicking the target and either clicking on it here in the viewport, or you can also use the outliner here if, with these things overlaying each other if it's a little bit difficult to select. So I'm going to use the outliner and click on that, and you can see that everything instantly kind of wraps to our sculpted mesh here. Now I'm going to go turn this off just so we can see things a little bit easier. And you can see that's done a, a, a pretty good job straight off the bat. Now there are multiple settings down here in the shrink wrap modifier. Depending on your model, you may find that a different method works better. But my personal favorite settings to use here is the project method, which does immediately kind of break absolutely everything until we hit the negative button here which then allows it to project both positively and negatively. And I usually find that above surface tends to work a little bit better. Now you can see in this instance, it has actually broken a couple of different things. That's okay, because ultimately I do want to show you how to fix some of these things. So you can see here, we've obviously got some pretty serious problems going on with the ears. We've also got something weird going on with his chin down here. I'm pretty sure there's something strange going on in his mouth and although you can't quite see it here if I just go and hide his eyeballs you can see that his eyes are also doing something funky in fact I think uh, the eyes might be the problem uh, more so than anything going on inside the mouth let's bring his eyeballs back so how do we go about fixing this one method that will go a long way to fixing uh, a few of these problems is to use this project limit the limit function here kind of says how far away are these vertices from their original position? I'm going to limit how far you can go from your initial starting position. So you can see, as we start to crank this up, we get kind of a weird rippling effect across the whole body. That's where every single vertice is saying, oh no, I, because it's set so low, it's going basically don't move it at all. And as we crank it higher and higher, you'll see that eventually we'll get back to where we were before with kind of everything being broken. The idea here is to kind of get it to a point where you're back to where you started and then slowly dial it down 
until you start to see some of these things disappear. So you can see his chin just kind of magically fixed itself there. And if I keep dialing this back, you can see that some of the eyes are there seem to have fixed. And now the ears are starting to fix and somewhere about 0.35, at least for this particular model, seems to have gone particularly well. So I'll just kind of dial it up and down just a little bit further just to see if I can't see any other vertices popping because that would indicate that they're not moving and we obviously want them to move at least a little bit. But that seems to have done a pretty good job. Now if we zoom in on the ears here you can see that some of these vertices are kind of overlaying each other in a bit of a weird way. This is still going to be a problem. The eyes are still a problem and as we uh, go and add our multi-res modifier you'll see a couple of additional problems will crop up but don't worry, we'll be going through and fixing all of those. Now, the other major problem is with the eyes. So if we just go and hide the eyeballs here, you can see that they're all really messed up. If we turn on our decimated topology here and reselect our retopo, I'm just going to turn the shrink rank off for a minute. And if we zoom right in here on the eyes, you can see that this doesn't perfectly align. So it's, it's trying to guess where it needs to project to. And because it's so far off, it doesn't quite know what to do. There's two things that we can do here. We could either come in here and uh, if you double tap G, you can kind of slide this edge back and that might work. In fact, it probably will work in this case, but I'm gonna show you an alternative method. I'm gonna go and select both of these rings of vertices on both sides and tap the control plus key. Mm, let's go twice this time. Disable that again so we can see a bit better. And just select a couple of edge loops around here. I'm then going to go to our object data here and create a new vertex group. And we're going to use this to exclude these vertices. I'm just going to call this, let's call it shrink wrap. And assign those vertices. Make sure that you do hit assign. There's been many times where I've had them selected, created the group and then gone, oh, why didn't it assign them? No, you actually have to hit assign for it to assign. So back here in our modifiers tab, let's turn our shrink wrap back on. Our eyes kind of go peculiar again. So now if we go in here and just type in shrink wrap and select our shrink wrap group and we will need to invert that selection, you'll see that now our eyes pop back into place very nicely. Okay, so we've sort of done everything that we can uh, at least up until this point just using the shrink wrap modifier. So let's move on to the next step. Let's go and apply our multi-res modifier. Now, the order of these is important. You will want to make sure that your multi-res is above your shrink wrap or it won't work properly. If you've got a rig, you'll also want the multi-res to be underneath the rig. And from here, all we're going to want to do is start to subdivide our multi-res. And you'll see that as we add additional geometry, it will use the shrink wrap to then wrap that new geometry to our uh, sculpted me mesh here. So if I just hit sub, in fact, let's turn our wireframe off so you can see this a little bit better. And let's go subdivide. And you can immediately see that we start to get a little bit more detail. You'll also possibly notice that some of these mistakes start to become a little bit more obvious. So we will need to keep our eye on those as we go higher and higher. Now I've done a little bit of experimenting with this, uh, with this character before. In my instance, I'm going to get it all the way up to level 3. I know that you can get a little bit more detail out of it if you go to level 4, but we are getting into you know several million polygons. Do keep in mind that a lot of these polygons are the claws and the teeth and the tongue and everything. So at the moment we're at around about 200,000. And as we subdivide this higher and higher, yes we will get more and more detail, but our poly count will continue to go up. So I'm going to go to level 3. You could go to level 4 if you really wanted to push it. You only get a little bit of extra detail from doing that. Or if your computer can't handle it, feel free to just go to level 1 or 2. I'm going to go one more subdivision and you can hear my computer start to chug and you can see now that we've started to get up into the one and a half million type polys but we're getting all of this detail or at least almost all of it this is looking very very nice except for our ears which we knew were going to break a little bit and we can also see that uh, his little this is where his uh, claws attach there's a couple of little glitches that are happening around so you've got your multi-res all subdivided up. Let's just minimize that because we don't need it. I'm just going to go and toggle our overlays back on so we can see our wireframe. The way that we now fix these tiny little problems, unfortunately, we can't really fix it by tweaking settings in the shrink wrap or anything. The way that we're going to fix this 
is by applying our shrink wrap modifier. That will then bake all of this new detail down into our multi-res and it will be baked in at multiple different levels. And you'll be able to see as we go up and down the levels in a moment that, uh, that these defects are kind of baked in slightly differently at each level. So let's put this back up to three for now. And let's go down to our shrink wrap and just go and apply it. And you will see that this disappears, but all of our details still remain. Those details have all been baked into our multi-res modifier, including all of our defects. So to fix these problems, we're going to need to manually smooth these areas back into place in sculpt mode. Now this can become a little bit tricky because the higher resolution your mesh is, the harder it becomes to smooth things out. So basically the more vertices there are, the less movement you get when you try and smooth. You might think that a nice easy solution to this would be to just drop your sculpting levels down to a lower resolution. And to a certain extent that is true, we can definitely smooth a lot more with a lower resolution. But, in fact maybe I can just do a quick demonstration here, if I smooth this out and then go back up to some higher levels, we actually don't really get rid of uh, these mistakes here. And in certain areas I know that it can cause some really bad problems, things will just sort of explode out in random directions. So let's undo a couple of steps here. So what I've found seems to be the best way is to do as much smoothing as possible on level three or whatever happens to be your highest level of subdivision and then drop it down to lower levels only if your mesh is too dense to smooth things properly. Let's walk through this so you can see exactly what I mean. Now I know that this mesh is ever so slightly asymmetrical so I am going to go down to my options here and just disable symmetry. That does mean that we will have to do both sides um, one after the other, which is a little bit more work, but it also means that we'll tidy things up properly. So let's go back into sculpt mode and let's start by smoothing out these ears. And this actually isn't going too bad for being on such a high level. I may just drop this back down to level two because I can see that these vertices here are really close together and that's possibly causing a little bit of weird overlap. These errors most often occur in areas where you have really thin geometry, like our ears here, or where you have geometry that's really close together. So for example, the corners of the mouth, maybe around the eyelids or between the fingers and toes. Okay, that seems to be okay. Let's drop it down to level two. And let's just make sure that this is being smoothed out a little bit more nicely. And in fact, I might even just go and grab my inflate brush and just thicken up this area a little bit because our smoothing has thinned out this area a little bit. Keep in mind that all this smoothing will cause you to lose a small amount of detail. I mean, that's literally what the smooth brush does. It smooths out details. So after you've done all these little fixes, it might be worth doing another pass of sculpting just to add some of these skin details back in. Okay, so that's looking good for having just smoothed it out on level two and three. Let's just jump back up to level three quickly and just make sure that it hasn't caused any additional issues. And there's a little, yeah, you can see up here we've got some strangeness that has occurred, but they're very, very small changes now. So in terms of preserving detail, I'd recommend doing your retopology before you do your final stage of sculpting. What I mean by that is do your initial sculpt to make sure you get in all of your major landmarks. So basically anything that contributes to the character's silhouette. So his shoulder armor or the big scale on his legs contribute to his silhouette. But leave the really fine skin details until after you've retopologized. So by skin details, I mean the small wrinkles, the little pimples that cover his body or the really small scales around his legs. So a step-by-step -step for this would go something like, do your initial sculpt using, for example, Dine Topo. Make sure to get all of your character's silhouette details sculpted. Then retopologize your character. Reproject your sculpted details onto your retopologized mesh using that shrink wrap and multi-res method. Fix any mistakes, which is what we're doing now. And then do one final sculpting pass to add all of those small details like wrinkles, skin pores, and small scales. And then finally create your displacement map, which is going to be our next step. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. Let's just isolate this by hitting the slash key. And let's get this chin area figured out. So still on level three here, let's smooth this back into place. 
as much as possible. I'm kind of starting to hit a bit of a limit here. It's getting very difficult to smooth. So again, let's drop it down to level two and smooth that out. And I'm still having some trouble here. So I actually might drop this down to level one. And that becomes much, much easier to smooth now. You can also use the relax slide tool here. I find that that gives a, it just spaces out your vertices a little bit better. And you can also click and drag to kind of space them out even better. So don't be afraid to go back and forth between your smooth and relax brushes. So now let's jump back up some levels. You see, we've only got some very small defects there. That's nice. Jump all the way back up to level three. And there's been a small explosion here, but that's very easy to fix. Let's just double check that the other side has also worked. It actually hasn't. We've got some weirdness going on here. I'm gonna drop down to level two just to make this a bit faster. Also remember that you can go inside your mesh. Sometimes things kind of get pulled on the inside and being on the inside can make the process a little bit easier. This is still causing me some issues. So I'm gonna drop down to one more level and smooth that out and that's much, much easier. Again, I'm gonna grab the relax brush and just make sure that these kind of space out a little bit more nicely and then start going back up the levels again, smoothing as we go. And then just quickly double check some areas that we know can be problems, like the inside of the mouth here. We're just getting a little bit of strangeness up in these corners. That's probably not too big a deal, considering you're very unlikely to be looking into the mouth too much. Now, we also know that the chin was an issue uh, when we were applying our shrink wrap modifier and using the limits. And you can see that this has messed up a little bit. In fact, this does seem to be symmetrical. So I'm gonna go and turn back on my symmetry for a moment and just fix both sides at once just space some of these vertices out a little bit better. Keep in mind that you really, even though these are very small areas and you're unlikely to ever really see them in a render, when we try to extract our displacement map in a little bit, having overlapping vertices like that can cause some very strange glitches to happen on your displacement map. So it's a good idea to just try and fix these, even if you don't think you'll see them in the final render. Okay, that seems to be everything. Uh, let's move on to the next step. So now that everything's kind of fixed, hopefully, anyway, uh, now would be the time if you felt like it to, uh, to come in here and try and add back in some of the detail that you've maybe lost in the process. Uh, or use it as an opportunity to add some additional skin details or something. Uh, we're not going to bother with that right now but just know that uh, this, is, this is the point in the process where you probably come through and do one last final sculpting pass just to make it really pop. Okay, so we've successfully reprojected our sculpted detail onto a new lovely retopologized mesh. We've fixed up any of, the, any of the mistakes that we've been able to find. Now is the time where we can start looking into extracting the actual displacement maps. Now, a quick tip, if you're only going to be working in Blender, you can, at least theoretically, stop here. You don't actually need to extract displacement maps. You can just use the multi-res modifier instead of having to extract displacement maps. So if we just go and turn on our rig here. Now, at the moment, trying to animate this would be an absolute nightmare because we've got the multi-res still turned on. And as you can see, that chugs absolutely terribly. So this would be unusable. However, there's no reason that we can't just come in here and turn off the multi-res in the viewport, but leave it on at render time. So now we could come in here and we could actually pose our character basically in real time without any significant problems. And you'll see now if I come back in here and turn the multi-res on, all of that detail is still there and gets, uh, gets pulled along with it. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, rigging issues that could possibly still be fixed here. But broadly speaking, if you've got your uh, your paint weight set up properly, 
all of this detail can just kind of come along for the ride. Now, that said, having the multi-res still in your Blender file will make for some fairly large file sizes, whereas extracting a displacement map gets that data outside of Blender and makes for some much smaller file sizes. Just something to consider if you have to consider hard drive space or moving fold files and folders around. The other thing is that this will only work in Blender. Most other 3D programs don't have an equivalent of the multi-res modifier. So if you wanted to take this character and for whatever reason put it into Maya, or maybe you want to port it to a, a game engine like Unreal or Unity, you, you will have to export either a displacement map or if you're exporting to a game engine, uh, a normal map, because this will only work with Blender. Let's turn the multi-res back on and turn off our rig. We won't need that for the rest of the lesson. The first thing that you want to do if you need to create displacement maps is to make sure that you have a UV map. Now, in our case, I've gone ahead and done a UV map for our character. So you'll get all of this as part of the download file. So this is a fairly simple UV layout. You will notice that it's laid out in a, in a bit of a logical way. So right at the top here, this top island is the head. On either side of that, we've got the two ears going down the center. We have the torso and then at the bottom, we have the feet. So it's kind of laid out like his body is laid out in a, in a nice logical kind of way. Uh, in fact, if anybody would like to see a, a more in-depth UV unwrapping tutorial, uh, let me know in the comments below. The only other thing to consider would be whether or not you want to use UDIMs. Now, UDIMs are just kind of a fancy way of having multiple UV layouts. So you might, for example, have the head and have it on its own separate UV layout. Uh, and then maybe have like the, the arms and the legs as their own separate UV layout. It, this just allows you to have multiple textures and will thus allow you to increase the overall resolution. Now, in this case, we won't be using uh, UDIMs. That's something I'm hoping to cover in a future tutorial. So if you downloaded this model, you'll already have UVs laid out for you. If you've created your own retopology, you will need to set up your own UVs before moving on to the next step. Now, setting up your displacement map, while it's fairly intuitive, if this is your first time doing it, it is fairly easy to get lost. So you do need to do these steps in a bit of a particular order, otherwise things can break and it can get a little bit confusing. So follow along, but I'll also do a breakdown of the major steps at the end of all of this, so you've got something to remember and follow along with. The first thing that we're going to need to do is to create a texture map for our displacement map to get saved into. So let's go over to our node editor, and our shading editor, and this guy already has a material on him. That's helpful. Just give myself a little bit more space here. And let's go and create an image texture. And we'll want to create a new image texture. Now the resolution that you set this to is completely up to you. For this kind of detail, I wouldn't recommend going below 2K. In my case, I'm going to go with 4K, which is 4,000 and 96 by 4096. At the other end, I probably wouldn't recommend going above 8K either. Most 3D programs, once you go above a certain texture file size, it can start to slow things down. It can start to slow down your render. If you need to have more than 8K textures, I'd recommend starting to look into the UDIMs. Let's name this gremlin underscore disp for displacement. And the other thing that's really important for working with the displacement maps is you really want to check the 32-bit float. Now, for those of you that just want to know which checkboxes to tick, feel free to jump ahead to the next timestamp. But for those of you that would like a bit of a more detailed explanation, here it is. The number of bits, so either 8 bits, 16 bits, or 32 bits, essentially refers to the amount of data that gets stored in a file. So most of the images that you'll see on the internet are going to be 8-bit. So that's JPEGs and PNGs, which you're probably quite used to. In fact, your monitor can't display anything more than 8 bits. Any higher and the screen just kind of filters it out. But if you're using 16 or 32-bit images, although you can't see the data on your screen, it is still stored in the file and Blender can use it. So for example, the HDRIs that you use for lighting work on the same principle. So within every HDRI is what's called f-stops and your HDRIs store several of these. So think of them as almost separate layers within, your, within a single image, with the lowest f-stop being really dark and the highest f-stop being really bright. It's this detail that allows us to plug them into Blender and then crank up our emission strength without completely blowing out the image. 
So displacement maps work on the same principle and store a lot more data than the eye can see, which allows us to get even more detail out of these 32-bit images than you could if you saved it as, say, a JPEG or a PNG. So my point is, for displacement maps, you want 32-bit or at least 16-bit, but please keep in mind that you only need these 32-bit images for HDRIs and displacement maps. You don't want to be using any of these to, say, plug into a diffuse map, for example. So with that rather scientific explanation, let's hit the OK and uh, we've created our empty texture map. So if I just swap this over to material mode, you can see that we've, we've got a texture, but there's currently nothing in it. So let's extract it and put something in there. The first thing that we're going to need to do is go and change our render engine to cycles. Unfortunately, EV doesn't have this capability, at least not yet. Uh, so we will need to use cycles and drop down to our bake options down here. Now you can see it comes up with a little pop-up here. Uh, baking is performed using CUDA instead of optics. That just refers to that just refers to what kind of graphics card you're using. So in my case I have an optics graphics card. You may have a CUDA. Baking in this instance has to use CUDA. Optics just it, it doesn't work for optics just yet. Now in previous versions of Blender when I was uh, when I was testing this earlier I actually had to come in here and change it to CUDA and you can see that that warning now disappears. Uh, this will now do that automatically behind the scenes. You don't need to swap it back. But if you're using an older version of Blender and this pops up, just remember that's where you change it. Under our bake type, we have all of these different options. But in this instance, because we've got the multi-res in place, we just want to bake from multi-res. And you can see that that now reduces us to just normals and displacement. If you're looking into a, a game engine like Unity or Unreal, you'll probably want to be uh, exporting normals here. In our case, we're going to at least assume that we're working in film or animation and we're going to choose displacement. Now, pro tip, you have the option here of just clicking this low resolution mesh. And what that will do will take your lowest level of subdivision, which would be zero in this case, and it compares it to your highest level of sculpt. And it's through this comparison that it creates a black and white image saying whether or not the geometry needs to be pushed out or in. Now, I found both in Blender and in ZBrush that using this lowest level can sometimes create a few additional uh, artifacts, which then give you a really bad displacement map. So what I personally like to do is actually set the viewport level here to 1, which gives it an ever so slight smooth. And then if we go back to our baking options and uncheck this low resolution mesh, it will then allow us to use whatever settings we want from here. So in this case, it will compare level 1 to level 3 to create our displacement map. Make sure that you've got your texture map selected over here. And now all we need to do is hit bake. And you can see that it starts to bake down here. And depending on your mesh, this is actually pretty quick. And as you can see, we've now got some detail here. If I turn off our wireframe, you can see there is our displacement map, or at least it's what the naked eye can see. Because remember, this is 32-bit. So there's actually a lot more detail here than we can see. Now, the first thing that you want to do after extracting your displacement map is pretty much immediately go to your image editor, load up the displacement map, and as you can see by this little star here, this isn't currently saved. So if I was to close Blender, I would lose this. So very, very quickly come in here and go save as. And you can see here that I was experimenting with a couple of different file types. So to save out our displacement maps, we're either going to want to use EXR, TGA or Targa or TIFFs. Now, technically you can use a PNG, which will also allow you to save at 16 bit, but PNGs also compress the image slightly. And these formats are generally non-compressed. So I did a little bit of experimenting with, uh, with all three of these formats. And I would recommend using the OpenEXR. Now, the, the TIFF and Targas do also both work. There's just a little bit more fiddling in some of the nodes later. I found that the EXR just kind of works straight off the bat. And you have the option of either saving it out as a half or a 16-bit or a full 32-bit. Now do keep in mind that using the full 32-bit here will end up with some much larger file sizes. With the experimenting I've done, I found that the 16-bit has worked perfectly fine. So I'm just going to go and save this as an EXR, and you can see that our image changes there, demonstrating that it has in fact been saved. And let's just double check and make sure that that is loaded correctly. So with our texture saved, the next thing we need to do is save another copy of our scene because we're about to do something here that will make it pretty much impossible to go back. So we want to go and save a new copy, just go save as, 
because the next thing we are going to do is come over here and delete the multi-res modifier. So with that gone, we've lost all of our sculpted detail. The only place we have that stored is in our displacement map here. So if for some reason we were to lose the displacement map, you've then lost the entire sculpt. So make sure you save a second copy. The multi-res modifier now gone, we are going to go back in here and we are going to apply a subdivision surface. This will now work as, uh, as adding that extra detail, but it currently doesn't have the settings that we need. For that, we need to go back to our settings here and under feature set, we need to set it to experimental. And we can hide our baking menu now. So now if we go back to our modifier, you can see we've got this adaptive subdivision. We want to turn that on. Usually when you apply a subdivision modifier, it just takes every single polygon and uh, divides it in four. And thus, thus creates significantly more detail. The adaptive subdivision is a little bit more complicated than that. Heaven knows how the math behind it works, but it takes into account how far away your camera is from the object, how detailed certain areas need to be, and it will up-res certain areas, like let's say we know that the, uh, the face has a lot of wrinkle detail, or if the camera was sitting particularly close to the face, it would make sure that this area here has significantly more polygons than, say, down here on his chest, which doesn't need as much detail. And it does that dynamically at render time. Using this adaptive subdivision is much better performance-wise because it will only add detail where it needs it, whereas in the multi-res modifier it was just adding detail to every single polygon. Okay, so that sets up our smoothing. Let's go and set up our material properly here. Uh, let's make sure that we've got the principled shader connected properly. And we don't really need this, so I'm just going to minimize that and shove him out of the way. And we're going to go to our search function here and look up displacement. And we want to use normal displacement. We will take the color data and plug it into the height. Also, just take note here that our color space is in linear. When we save this out as an EXR, Blender was smart enough to automatically set that up for us. We want linear. Because this is uh, 16 or 32 bit, depending on how you saved it, it doesn't work in the sRGB space. That gets into some pretty scientific stuff. Just know that we want it set to linear. And then we will plug this into the displacement on our material output. And you can see that we start to get some information here. Now, take note that in the viewport, this is just bump map information. This isn't actually a displacement map, although it may look like it. Now, the one last thing that we need to do is uh, Blender by default, displacement maps aren't turned on. So we want to make sure that we've got our object selected and go to our material properties, go all the way down not under displacement, interestingly enough, under settings. And you can see here we've got displacement bump only. So that's the only information that we're getting right now. If we were to do a, uh, if we were to do a test render, it might look kind of okay. No, it might look a little bit better if we actually had some lighting information. Hold on a second. Let me just go and throw in an environment texture. I've got some HDRIs sitting around for just such an occasion. Let's use the let's use the kitchen. The kitchen gives some fairly nice lighting off the bat. So although this looks like we've got some at least some detail here, if you kind of zoom in here, particularly on the, these armor on his plates here, and you turn the displacement off, you can see that the uh, the shape of the geometry doesn't change. The silhouette stays the same. I'm just going to lower this a little bit. Uh, so currently this is only working as a bump map. So we want to make sure that this is set to, at the very least, displacement or displacement and bump. In our case we probably only need displacement, but if you wanted to add a bump map as well as your displacement, you'd want to click displacement and bump. And if we just give that a moment, you can see that now we're getting something. This has, uh, has very much broken up our silhouette, but maybe not in a particularly appealing way. Now, this is okay. This is just because we've got our scale set a little bit too high. And in fact, just before we do that, I'm going to drop down to our sampling. I'm going to change my viewport just to 64. Why not use adaptive sampling? And I'm going to throw on denoising. In my case, I'll use optics. Uh, you may not have optics. Depends on your graphics card. Feel free to use either of the other two. They, they all work pretty well. And I might just set our start sample at about 16. Now I've done a little bit of experimenting. I know that if you've used the same setup I've been using, changing it to 0.2 should give you some very good results. Now keep in mind if you did save this out as a TIFF or a TARGA, I found that I did need to play with the mid-level a little bit. 
Just keep in mind that these file formats do kind of save their data a little bit differently. So depending on what you used, you may need to tweak your settings a little bit more or a little bit less. This is why I liked the OpenEXR. So overall, I think this is looking pretty good. Uh, in, fact, in fact, I might even just lower this a little bit more. Let's see how 0.1 looks. I still feel like we're getting a little bit of um, jaggy sort of edges happening here. And that looks a little bit better. I might also just darken his material a little bit. Just so we can see it a little bit nicer. So this is looking pretty good. But if you kind of zoom in on some certain areas, you might notice that there's still a few little defects. You can see some of these little um, pimples or moles or whatever here. They're not looking quite as smooth as perhaps you might like them. So the dicing scale here refers to how much resolution the modifier is adding. You can see that in the final render here, it's set to 1, but in the viewport, it's actually set to 8. Now, in this case, a smaller number means more resolution. We could play with this dicing scale, however it can become very memory intensive, so I try and avoid using it unless I have to. You can see that the final render is going to have significantly more detail than what we're seeing in the viewport anyway. So in this case, I would leave it alone. That said, if you want to make sure that these little details are still being picked up, you can just try upping the viewport resolution. So if we crank that to 2 and just give it a brief moment, it should refresh. And you can see even with that, we're starting to get a little bit more resolution. It's a little bit more rounded. So I think I'm going to leave that alone. And this is quite nice. We're even picking up some of his vein details here. So that's kind of cool. Now, as I say, this kind of rendering with uh, displacement maps and the adaptive subdivision, it can be quite memory intensive. So, I mean, I'm using a uh, 2080 Ti graphics card. So it can, it can usually handle this, although I have to say, I, I even managed, when I played with the dicing scale, I even managed to, uh, to crash this graphics card. You, you may find that you need to swap over to CPU to do your final render. Give it a test with your GPU. If it throws up an error saying that it ran out of memory, then that means that your graphics card can't deal with the amount of geometry that you're throwing at it. You will need to swap it over to the CPU. So that was a fair bit of information we just covered. Let's just quickly recap it. First of all, you want to create a new texture to hold your displacement map. Then you want to go and bake your displacement map with your appropriate settings. With the map baked and saved, you want to go and add a subdivision modifier. To get the adaptive sampling, we do need to make sure that we are set to experimental. Then you can go back and turn on your adaptive subdivision. And then finally, make sure that your material is set to use at the very least displacement or bump and displacement. Now I hear you saying, that looks fantastic in cycles, but hmm, maybe my computer's not quite powerful enough to handle this. What about EV? Well, the downside is that displacement maps, at least as materials, don't work in EV. So if we just swap this over, let's just zoom in on, say, his plates here, and let's swap this over to EV. And you'll see that we basically lose all of our displacement information. This is back to just being a bump map. Unfortunately, EV is not uh, designed, it's not powerful enough to be able to use displacements, at least not like this. However, there is a workaround. So let's detach our displacement from here. We will leave this in here just in case we want to jump back into cycles for later, but let's just leave it for now. And now if we go back to our modifiers tab, you can see that we've lost our adaptive sampling. This is the main reason that it doesn't work in EV. So what can we do to try and get it to work in EV? Not too hard. Let's go to add modifiers and let's go and find under deform. We want the, where's the displace modifier? There we go. And you can see we get a really weird kind of squishy teddy bear looking thing. Don't worry. Uh, let's just set this strength really, really low about 0.1, which is kind of what we've got the same as the scale over here. He still looks kind of weird and pudgy. That's because we now need to go and create a new texture. Now he looks like the Slender Man. We can click this little button here to take us over to the texture tab. It's already set to image or movie. We don't need to go to a new or open. We've already got it in the blender scene. So let's just go and choose Gremlin Displace. And you can see it will initially start by getting, I don't even know what this is. This is just awful. Uh, that's because of our coordinates. Because we've got this set up based on our UV maps, we need to set this to UV. Now you can see that we're starting to get this detail. To make this work properly in EV, you will need to crank up your subdivision levels. 
So let's try and set this to three, which is roughly what we had our multi-res at. And now you can see that we're starting to get, well, I'd say most or all of those details. I reckon that's done a pretty good job. We've even got this little cut in his armor plate here. We're getting the veins on his arms. That's, that's, uh, that's pretty good. So as you can see, this method here is pretty similar to just leaving the multi-res modifier. So again, let's just uh, jump back into solid mode and turn on our rig. So just like with the multi-res modifier, it would basically be impossible to animate this with the, uh, with the subdivision turned on. So like we did with the multi-res, we can just come in here and turn that off so that it will only work at render time. Alternatively, we can leave that on and set our subdivisions down to zero. Or we could even set it to maybe one or something, depending on how powerful the computer is. And now we can come in and animate on this and it's pretty much real time. And if I drop that down to zero, we should get very, very fast. Very, very nice. Yes, very nice. So you could either leave your multi-res modifier on or you could use this method. I would probably recommend going with this method because again, that multi-res modifier has a lot of data stored inside of it. It will make for much larger file sizes. Whereas in this is kind of, it's really only doing it at render time. It's going and getting that data out of the uh, out of our texture map and um, our subdivisions are only getting applied at render time. So you should, should end up with much smaller file sizes. Now, if you want to get some additional practice setting up displacement maps, let's just go and hide this and turn off the rig. You'll see here that everything like the tongue has a multi-res modifier on it, the teeth, all of these little spikes and stuff around his face, all of his claws uh, all have multi-res modifiers on them. And therefore, you should probably be applying a displacement map to these as well. So if you want a little bit of additional practice, you can go through, you can UV map these and uh, create your own displacement maps. So feel free to jump onto those next. Now, the only other thing that I felt was worth mentioning, if you feel like you're not quite getting enough detail out of your texture maps here, you obviously have the option of up them to... Uh, either 8K or, well, like I say, I probably wouldn't go any higher than 8K. Or alternatively, you can try using the UDIM's uh, UVing system, and that's something that we'll be discussing in a future lesson. So, until then.